So it's a, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, I'm really delighted. Thank you to the organizers for having me uh, on this wonderful occasion. Uh, Frank was a student of mine. I don't know if everyone knows that, but, but nevertheless, I discovered today that I, someone knew you before you were a student of mine. I thought I was the oldest person. So, um, the, the, you know, and you can see that he was a student of mine because, you know, normally thesis advisors have an influence on their thesis uh, students and you could see what an influence I had on Frank. Indeed, he arrived a little late. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's a proof, the proof, final proof that uh, I influenced him. So, of course, having Frank as a student is really a luxury. <laughs> it's really luxury and uh, so, you know, and it was really a wonderful, wonderful experience. I remember, so, um, you first took my course at École Normale Supérieure, my first year course at École Normale Supérieure, 1982, or, yeah, and then, in 1983, and then you, you came to my graduate course, in, uh, and then you, you asked me for a subject. So it was really wonderful since then. I remember at that time I was working on, uh, on ground, state, ground states and scalar field equations and uh, instability results I had also. So I, I suggested to Frank to, to look at uh, some problems I thought very difficult. And uh, also serendipity uh, played a role because one of, the, one of the days in which Frank came to my office we were going to discuss about these questions and I just had an envelope on my desk. I opened the envelope and I saw the paper of Ginibre and Velo and I said to Frank, have a look at that, it looks interesting. So <laughs> just by pure chance. And um, so, so, and of course I was really amazed by, very, very early on by what he was able to produce and what he came back with. Um, and, and we all know what a wonderful career he has had ever since. But um, I also want to say that uh, Frank is, uh, so we also worked on other topics uh, together. In fact, at some point at École Normale Supérieure, we were uh, recruited to do some uh, consulting in, in, in industry. It was for a uh, helicopter firm, which is now called Eurocopter, biggest producer, f maker of helicopters in Europe. At that time, it was called Aerospatial near Marseille, Marignan. And uh, we were supposed to work on modeling how blades of the helicopter rotor, rotor uh, are deformed by the forces. It's a nightmarish problem, I tell you. It has all the, everything changes at the same time. And, and we were very brave enough, I think, well, I think I want just to say that Frank is someone who is uh, not afraid of anything. You know, I'm a scientist, nothing, I'm afraid of nothing. And uh, so we started, basically we started to reconstruct elasticity from scratch. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember at some point uh, we were having, we were making these um, computations and it became really, there was a book of uh, computations. Frank was not afraid of doing developments which took, you know, uh, expansions which took, you know, 20, 50 pages. And um, after that, we ve very much understood why in elasticity people make approximations. <laughs> so that, was, that was a very good lesson. But it was a great, it was a lot of fun to do that together. We, you know, we al almost, always, almost always were working on this in the plane, going there, down there, we're arriving and thinking what we are going to say. <laughs> so it was a very fun experience. And, uh, but helicopters, uh, nonetheless, continue to fly <laughs> in, spite, in spite of our, of our activity. So, okay, so, uh, and when I, when I met Frank, he was more or less like uh, this wonderful painting that Rebecca, his wife, uh, has done. It's a really marvelous painting. Very, I think she captures, of course, something very important of Frank. We all, we all recognize this. Okay, so I want to tell you about um, some, some ongoing work I'm doing with um, uh, Cole Graham, from, uh, who is now an NSF postdoc at Brown University, who has a PhD from, I met him in Stanford. And uh, we have been interested in, uh, in proving uh, results about um, uh, semilinear elliptic equations. I'll just 
immediately show you these equations. But, I, but I, we, as we went along, we discovered that there is really a gen, some kind of general principle there, which we like to call the sta stability compactness method. And I want to try to, to show you, to illustrate this on some, uh, some of the results I'm going to present. But I think the, the method in itself is, uh, has an interest. So, uh, so stationary states of reaction diffusion equations, so reaction diffusion equations is one of the simplest nonlinear equations, PDE equation you can think of, which is d t u by d t minus Laplace u equals f of u. And this is, uh, you know, this equation is a basic building block of mathematical biology. It's really an equation that appears, systems of equations like that appear all the time in, in biology, in ecology, in, in other areas of modeling. And, and, um, and so often when you think about these equations, it's studied in all of, the spa in all of space, if you want to understand um, propagation. But often also you want to understand how the domain of propagation will uh, influence the phenomenon you're studying. So you are then led to study an equation which is in a domain, and I'm going to specifically think of an unbounded domain. We are interested in positive solutions, and of course then you have to look at the boundary condition on, to impose a boundary condition on the boundary of omega for it to make sense. So the general question I want to discuss is, when can you say that positive bounded solutions is unique? When a positive bounded solution is unique? That's a question I'm going to, to discuss today and for uh, restrict it here to positive reaction terms F. Now, the, uh, there are many different positive reaction terms that come into play. I'll soon mention two with the KPP term, Kolmogorov, Petrovsky, Piskunov, which has been the object of enormous amount of studies, even recently, even nowadays. And um, there's a positive term, combustion nonlinearity, bistable uh, also examples. I'll, but I'll, I'll restrict myself to positive reaction. And of course, in terms of boundary conditions, you have Dirichlet condition, Neumann, Robin condition. I'm going to focus here on, uh, sorry, I'm going to focus here on um, the Dirichlet condition, u equal to zero. And, uh, in fact, there are many open questions for, us about for the Robin, not for Neumann, but for Robin conditions. So I'm going to discuss the Dirichlet condition here. So I'm interested here in positive reaction terms. So what that means, exactly what is written here, I'm going to consider solutions which live between 0 and 1, value they have their values between 0 and 1. F is something which has two uh, stationary states, it's constant stationary states, 0 and 1. And I'm going to assume that f is positive on this interval and that the derivatives here have signs. f prime of 0 is positive, f prime of 1 is negative. I'm going to assume this. And so that's the general positive nonlinearity I'm going to, to assume here. And in fact, what you want to understand here is when you look at this equation, in some sense what you have here, you have two contrasting effects. One is the fact that f of u is positive, so there's production owing to the reaction, and then the boundary condition means that you have absorption because of the boundary condition. And uh, those are two constructing effects. That's why direct boundary conditions uh, is, uh, create a certain uh, you know, interesting phenomenon. So let me first start with boundary domain. What is known for boundary domains? So in fact, in boundary domains in general, you don't have uniqueness. So here's a result that says that if you, take a, if you take any bounded smooth domain omega, then you can always find positive nonlinearities, nonlinearities of the kind I just wrote before, for which you have at least two positive solutions. So in bounded domains, just, you know, you cannot hope to have uniqueness as such. And uh, these examples that you can, that you use to do that, I, is this type of nonlinearity. So this type of nonlinearity is like the camelback, if you want, there's two humps. And the way, the way you construct this, once omega is fixed, once omega is fixed, the way you construct this is you, find, you first find a solution whose values are between 0 and 1. Basically, you minimize the energy when you bring this down to 0. So you have a solution so that the maximum principle will tell you it's below, it's below the value where it turns back. And then if this hump is large enough, then the 
the overall minimization will yield another solution whose maximum will be rather here. You have one here and one there. So, so clearly, just positivity it doesn't suffice. Okay? Is it true in general? So this is what we want to, to say. But before I go further, let me just single out two uh, subclasses of positive re reaction terms. One, so one is the so-called KPP, often, often it's called KPP, let me call it weak KPP condition. The weak KPP condition is one where F lies below its tangent at the origin. And often in all this uh, propagation and, and so on, what is really used, that's the property that is being used for, uh, for, for all the propagation results, traveling waves, etc. Let me call here strong KPP, something which is a stronger assumption. I'm going to assume that the intercept here, the slope of the intercept, is decreasing with S. Okay? So F of S over S strictly decreases when S is in between 0 and 1. Okay? That's what I call strong KPP. Strong KPP contains, uh, is contained in the weak KPP case, of course. Okay, so uh, for strong KPP, the previous result doesn't hold, there's uniqueness. And uh, let me just, just show you, you see, the example I had was this one. And what we are saying here is that if this thing is concave, if you want, but it's more general, uh, then there's uniqueness. So this is an old result of Rabinowitz. Uh, will prove that in this case there is a bound, the omega is bound and smooth and F is, tr is tr strong KPP, then the positive solution is unique when it exists. And um, I also had the proof of a slightly more general result uh, some years later with a little bit different method. But l let me just say about this result of Paul, the, the idea is very simple. Okay, the idea is this. You t suppose you have two solutions, U and V. Then you look at the ratio uh, v over u, and because omega is bounded and smooth, because omega is bounded and smooth, this ratio is, uh, is bounded also. You can prove it's bounded. That's really uh, half lemma if you want, or something like that. And then what you look at, you look at the maximum of v over u, basically. That's what, so with some algebra here, looking at the maximum of v over u, you find that, and then using the strong KPP property, you can prove that the over u is less than or equal to 1. It requires a little bit of work. It's not as straightforward as I wrote it, but still, it's, that, that's the idea. So strong KPP property is used here to do, to do that. Okay? That was Paul's, Paul's result. And therefore, once you know that v over u is less than or equal to 1, you have v less than or equal to u, and therefore v is equal to u because you can reverse your the, the choice of u and v. The symmetries need to be, if, one is, if number one is less than number two, then the two are equal, okay. So, um, so the question is this, okay. So the question is, uh, can this, is this true? So the, there will be several things, but first of all, is this non-uniqueness true for the unbounded domain so for, for positive f? But in KPP case, is uniqueness true in unbounded domain general? It looks such a nice and natural result you tend to believe that it is true in any unbounded domain. Now, it turns out that the story is a bit complicated. So, uh, so this is a question, what about general unbounded domain omega? When can you say you have uniqueness or non-uniqueness? And I'm going to consider two different topics in my talk. In the first hour, I'll speak about the strong KPP case. <laughs> in the second hour, I'll speak about general positive nonlinear reaction term. But OK, so don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> so let me start with the strong KPP equation in unbounded domain. So strong KPP equation, I remember, this means that the intercept is decreasing, Fs over S decreases uh, with S. And uh, we will, so we are going to prove uniqueness in this case in unbounded domain, but at this point we are not able to prove it in full generality. We have a non-degeneracy assumption, and I want to discuss this non-degeneracy assumption. So. <coughs> For the standard general assumption, we need um, spectral properties. So spectral properties in this case, uh, when you have a, a weight uh, Q, an infinity weight in omega, if you look at the operator minus Laplace plus Q, you can define, there's no difficulty in defining 
in the classical way, the principal eigenvalue of minus r plus plus q in omega. Just take the infimum of the Rayleigh equation, and that's true for a general open set. You don't have to worry about about, uh, of course, then if you want to say that satisfies the equation, etc., you need to have some assumptions of regularity. But this definition is lambda. There is we, we also played with uh, the Nirnberg Rad, and we have another definition, which is more general. And in some sense, um, we, uh, this definition, some of the properties we proved there, in particular with Rossi, extending this, extending this to unbounded domains, uh, you, we are going to use that. So let me just also say that lambda 1 of minus L omega is the limit of the principal Dirac eigenvalues in omega intersect BR when R goes to infinity. So we have this property. That was essentially proved by Agmon already at the time when Frank was starting his thesis. <laughs> so, uh, so first of all, let me just say about uh, characterization. Why, why does this uh, eigenvalue play a role? Well, you can characterize the existence of uh, a solution for this problem for the KPP case with this lambda 1 and when you compare it to f prime of 0. So comparing it to f prime of 0 means, so remember we are in a domain omega, we have directly boundary condition and when we compare this to f prime of 0 it amounts to saying whether 0 is linearly stable or not stable. That's what it means. So the solution, the result is this. If you um, F is a weak KPP is enough for that. Uh, if lambda 1 is less than F prime of 0, that is 0 is an uh, unstable solution, then uh, there is a positive solution. Whereas if it has no, well if lambda 1 is strictly greater than F prime of 0, then there is no positive solutions. So 0 is stable. In fact, it means all, everything co co will converge to 0 if you look at the evolution equation. So this is a result, and let me just point out that even at this stage, <coughs> the critical case lambda equals f prime of zero, in full generality is open. And we believe that if f is strong KPP, <coughs> then there is no solution. And uh, when lambda one equals f prime of zero. But even this simple looking question uh, remains uh, unsolved. It's true in bounded domains. In bounded domains, you prove it directly. It's very simple to show. Okay, what is the difficulty with unbounded domains? Uh, uh, I should have said this, maybe let me come back to this. Let me just explain, just simply the, the oh here, maybe it's here. So, <coughs> you see in unbounded domains, you may have regions of the domains extending to infinity with different, different branches, different parts of the domain. In some of these domains, lambda one, if you restrict to this branch of the domain, may be bigger than zero, than f prime of zero, or be uh, in other less than f prime of zero. So you may have existence because lambda one will be bigger than, will be less than f prime of zero uh, in some region. But <coughs> if you go further, further along this branch where lambda one becomes less, uh, bigger than f prime of zero, then it means that in this direction, the only thing you can see is that you will go to zero. Right? <coughs> because in the limit, the equation is an equation with lambda 1 bigger than f prime of 0. So you expect this to go to 0. So it's very different. Remember when in the bounded domain case, we were working with v over u. In an unbounded domain case, v over u can have uh, very strange behavior at infinity. You need to control what is happening. You don't know. There's no way you can prove a priori that v over u is bounded. OK, so, so this is a uh, result. So for, uh, so let me, let me introduce now the condition under which we can prove uniqueness. And uh, as I just explained, the behavior at, um, at infinity plays a major role. So we're going to look at all possible limits of omega. So you look at, if you want, you know, you look at translates and you see a long sequence of points. And I'm going to call C, uh, sigma the, we look at connected components, <coughs> connected, co connected limits. So we only take, you know, in the limit, we have, say, a domain which takes two branches. If you go in this direction, you will have two distinct branches unconnected. So by connected, by limit, I mean only the connected components of these limits, I separate connected components. And, uh, and then we can define what we call the limiting, principal limiting spectrum. So this is 
we call it sigma star of minus Laplace and omega. And this is the principal eigenvalue of minus Laplacian in omega star for any possible uh, such limit. So it contains the domain itself. The domain itself is one, one such candidate, but if it contains all branches, when you go to infinity. Then the theorem we prove is this. Suppose so we are dealing with a strong KPP type. Suppose that omega is non-critical in the sense that f prime of zero is not in the closure of this generalized principal spectrum. Then the solution, positive solution, is unique. Okay, so then the positive solution is unique. Uh, I want to add right away that we conjecture that this should be true for any uh, unbound, for any domain, any open domain, at least we can say uniformly smooth domain, okay, avoiding pathological situation. But this is not known. I'm going to give you examples to show, but our result is generic. So in some sense you can say that generically uh, the solution has a unique solution. The problem has a unique solution in unbounded domains. I'll try to explain to you where this condition comes up now. So first of all, what's the de non-degeneracy condition? So here's the domain omega. Omega with it's here plus some t's here going to infinity. So it's like a comb, right? So this is a connected domain omega. And uh, in the plane, so non-degeneracy means that hi will stay away from, from, away from pi over square root of f prime of zero. So infimum of this will be bounded away from zero, infimum of the difference. There is no, so the degeneracy means when one of these twos becomes critical and at infinity you just have lambda one equals f prime of zero, okay? Okay, so, uh, so lambda one is just h, it's just pi over h square. So, um, so this is the condition of non-degeneracy. As you see, it's really, uh, it's really um, uh, generic. And what do we, how do we use this? So let me give you an idea of the proof uh, how we do that in non-critical domains. So the first the idea is this. When you have such a domain which is non-critical, then you can always, uh, then there will be a spectral gap. Okay, so there will be a spectral gap. That is, no limit will, will, be, will have a, an, uh, an eigenvalue which will become close to f prime of zero. So there's an, uh, there is a gap, if you want, between those uh, parts of the domain where lambda one is below f prime of zero and one where it's strictly above it. We can then use this gap to decompose the domain omega into two parts. So as a union, we write omega as union of omega plus and omega minus. And omega plus is one which lambda, lambda one is strictly above f prime of zero. And omega minus is one where sigma star is strictly below f prime of zero. So in fact, what we want really is not only that, but we want that sigma star of all possible limits, all possible limits of this set omega minus be strictly below f prime of zero. So that's, uh, that's uh, the decomposition. Now, this is not, uh, not simple. It requires quite a lot of work. And, uh, and it's rather delicate. And for this, to prove this, to prove this decomposition, we rely on a wonderful result of Elliot Lieb. Elliot Lieb was mentioned today by uh, uh, Thierry Jamarki. Where is he? Uh, I saw him. So anyways, <laughs> Thierry. So Thierry mentioned this this morning. <laughs> and, uh, and indeed, this is a wonderful result of Lieb it was published in Inventiones. The same year, all those things happened when Frank started his thesis, right? <laughs> so he chose this result accordingly. <laughs> and what, what, what Lee proves, a really wonderful result, not known, for some reason people have uh, forgotten about this result. It says this, it says that if you look at the principal eigenvalue of the Laplacian in a domain A, then uh, if you take a ball B, a domain, another domain B, and you, uh, if you want to compute lambda 1 of minus Laplace in A, then up to an error which will be lambda 1 of minus Laplace in B, uh, you can just find more or less lambda 1 of in A by moving around the window. So you can think of B plus X, you have your unbounded domain A, and you can think of B plus X as the windows that you move around. And 
But Leap says that if you move around your window, eventually you're going to find lambda 1 of in A, which is a wonderful result. So this result says that it's localized. It says that the eigenvalue is local. You can, starting with an unbounded domain, you can somehow pin down up to a certain error. You can pin down your eigenvalue by looking in a given window. It's a remarkable result, very deep result. And uh, that's what I wrote here. So lambda 1 is local. So in particular, lambda 1 minus Laplace in omega, I wrote it for BR of x. What is uh, lambda 1 of BR of x? It's, it's, a, it's a constant over R square. So basically, lambda 1 minus Laplace in a big domain, unbounded domain omega, is like Laplace in omega uh, intersect BR of x, provided you choose your x, uh, you place your x uh, uh, smartly. OK, so. Uh, so here's a decomposition. I just want to point out two, two examples of decomposition. So here's a domain. So these are large chunks, and they are connected by two channels, which are becomes longer and longer and are thin, thinner than the critical value. And therefore, you see what's happening in the limit. What you're going to get is uh, you take this part and this part, this part. This is going to be omega plus. Omega plus, you should think of it when lambda 1 is big. Those are thin parts narrow parts of your domain. And omega plus are, on the contrary, ample parts of the domain, where there is a, you, are, you can find, so in omega plus, you're always close to the boundary, if you want. Omega minus could contain large balls. That's what the domain is. And here's an example of such a decomposition in this domain that I drew before. So by the way, the decomposition is not unique. I mean, they overlap, of course, and so on. And this is, a, but you need to construction really re will rely on this result of Lieb. And uh, how do we use the decomposition now? So we use it in the following manner. So let me, I, let's take again the proof that I outlined in the, in the bounded domain. The proof that I online, outlined was to study u over v. So u over v uh, is going to pose a problem only uh, in the, in the, ample part, right? So, so because in a narrow part, because of this condition of spectral gap, u over v cannot go, u and v cannot go to zero. They can go to zero only in this, in this large part. And therefore, uh, you get, you get it is balanced. So it shows that u and v cannot go to zero. And it works in this, um, in this part in the omega minus. In omega plus, uh, uh, omega plus is, a, I will confuse, the narrow part. Omega plus lambda 1 is bigger than f prime of 0. And then the problem is linearly stable, as I said before. So you see what's happening. Because lambda 1 is bigger than f prime of 0, when you look at, uh, you can, and because of the KPP property, you can use the maximum principle there. Basically, you know, the maximum principle, even in some bounded domain, is essentially when you have lambda 1 positive of the right problem. But here, even though it's nonlinear, you also have the same property. Therefore, what you have from comparing u and v in omega minus, you can then transfer to omega plus, because there the maximum principle applies. Right? So it's like you have a, a narrow tube, but inside this narrow tube, at the boundary, at the initial boundary of this narrow tube, you already know from the other part. So this is the essence of the stable compactness method that I mentioned. You, you first use the, um, you first use the maximum, you first use compactness in some sense to obtain a bound. In this case, it's about u over v, uh, the best constant kappa so that kv minus u is positive if you want. And then you transfer it by using the maximum principle in the region where you have stability. So that's what I call stability. So in fact, it turns out that this method is very general and can do a lot of things for you. So let me now move to, so this is the result we obtain for the KPP case. Let me now move to general, uh, general positive, um, general positive nonlinearity. So we, let's forget about the KPP assumption. We just look at F merely positive as I drew before. And remember, in a bounded domain, for such f, there is no uniqueness in general in the bounded domains. What can we prove here? 
well, we know that in fact it's not difficult to show under our assumption f prime of zero is positive plays a role here. We know that any bounded positive solutions of minus Laplace v equals f of v in our n is one. The only positive non-bounded non non solution is the constant one. This you can show, it's a consequence of maximum principle, it's not difficult to show. And uh, it requires a proof, of course, but you, ca you can prove it. It's a kind of Liouville theorem, if you want, a nonlinear Liouville theorem. So the question is this. Uh, you have unbounded domains, you have non-uniqueness. <coughs> we have seen examples. In all of space, you have uniqueness. What's happening here? What is, wh what is, the, wh what is the limit between the two? So let's investigate this question. Sorry. Uh, so let me start with uh, result, an older result, about Lipschitz graphs, domains bounded by Lipschitz graphs. So epigraphs defined by y, m by xn bigger than a phi of x1, x2, xn minus 1. So it's a domain which is an epigraph in Rn, where phi is uniformly Lipschitz on Rn minus 1. Globally, so there's the same Lipschitz constants all. So what we prove is Louis Caffarelli and Will Nirenberg, that was a paper in CPM 97, we prove that if you take such a domain bounded by uniformly Lipschitz graph, an f of positive type, the same type of f that I showed you at the beginning, then the solution is unique. Solution of this equation is unique. And uh, not only is unique, but then you can prove that as your distance to the boundary increases, you will converge to one. The solution will be uh, stable. And u is also monotone with respect to xn. In fact, then u is monotone in the cone of directions because once you have a uniformly Lipschitz graph, you can also read it, you can tilt the direction and still have a Lipschitz graph. So it's going to be monotone in the cone of directions. This, by the way, uh, we are led to that. We were led to that by uh, questions of regularity uh, of one phase free boundary problems. This was, uh, we were working on from models of combustion, the simplest model of combustion, and we needed to prove that the free boundary has a certain smoothness. And to start with, if you, you know, you do a blow up, you have, you have certain Lipschitz, uh, function is Lipschitz, you know that, but you want to think that the free boundary itself has a certain regularity. So when you do a blow up uh, of this problem, the Lipschitz constant remains the same. You keep the Lipschitz character, and what you want to know is that you have uh, the fact that the solution is a one-phase problem. So it's zero on one side, and you want to know that it's increasing on the other side. And the fact that it's increasing and that you have this cone of directions give you the starting point of regularity. After that, of course, you can obtain further regularity using uh, Luis Caffarelli's methods uh, that many of you know uh, how to upgrade. The but the first starting point was this one. So that plays a very important role for that. And um, so, so this was really the first step, and, this, and we run, that's how we run into this problem of graph. But the question is, can you say, uh, can you say uh, what can you say beyond this graph? So to do that, let me explain the, the proof uh, we had with, uh, with this, uh, Luis and Louis in this work, and let me try to understand how we can extend it. Okay. So, um, so the first result is this one. So the first result is to prove, the, to prove that what's happening away from the boundary. So the first thing is to say, if you, uh, if you choose, a, uh, well, there, there exists delta and R0, so that if you are at a distance at least R0 away from the boundary, your solution will be bound away from 0, which means you cannot converge to 0 at infinity in this case, which, of course, will mean the second step, that you will converge to 1 at <coughs> infinity uh, as you move away from the boundary, right? Because it's bounded away from zero. You cannot stay away from a zero of f. You know, so it will accumulate mass. Laplace will accumulate mass, so this cannot happen. And uh, therefore, uh, as um, you get these two estimates. So away from the boundary, first of all, if you are at a certain distance away from the boundary, you are below, you are above delta. And then if you go further away from the boundary, you actually you converge to one. So which means that the action takes place in a finite neighborhood of the boundary in some sense. 
So the next lemma of this is the sliding method. That's how we, we introduce this method in this framework. And uh, sliding method means this. You have your original graph. And so you translate your uh, graph upwards. So I'm calling omega h the translate of omega by h e n, e n the nth vector, the basis vector. And I translate v accordingly, which I call v h. So which means translate it upward, which means v h of x prime x n is v of x prime x n minus h. It's defined in omega h, the one when I push the graph upwards. And so the next step is to prove that for h large, if you translate things far away from the, enough far away from the boundary, but for finite h, there will be a finite h where, uh, where, where such that vh will be, will be below u in omega h. And the reason for that is that by the first steps, you can, if you translate far enough, and because it's Lipschitz, by the way, because it's uniformly Lipschitz, when translate far away, you are uniformly far away from the boundary. Something that does not happen in the in non Lipschitz case. And um, <laughs> and so uh, f so so we are going to use the fact that f is decreasing near one. That's the assumption f prime of one negative. And uh, and then we say in this region u is bigger than one minus h. Then you compare u and v in a region where f prime is decreased, where f prime is negative. Where if v is touching u, it is happening in the region where u is almost one. In this region, f prime is negative. So you compare two solutions of a problem which has the right uh, monotonicity. You know, when f is decreasing, minus Laplace minus f has the right monotonicity, you can compare. So the maximum principle tells you that in this region, in this region, right, the um, so stability of one ensures so stability again ensures that uh, vh will be less than because vh is equal to zero on the boundary of this set and u is positive then this will be translated the maximum principle will apply because we have re reduced the problem in a region where where u lives f is strictly decreasing when you do that okay so that's that's it. and then the next step is that sliding the sliding method next step means you start reducing h you bring back your h down to zero so you start with the h very far away for which you know this inequality and you bring it down to the maximal minimal position of h for which you have this inequality the same inequality what is happening as such an h star so the h star is this so you see the h star um, you still have you still have the inequality uh, at the limit value and basically what you can say is that you can push a little bit further down than h. if h star is not zero you can push a little further down why because far away from the boundary but at a fixed distance things will remain the same as before and when you bring it down a little bit more it's only happening at a fixed distance of the boundary so you have compactness in some sense you have combined so this is you see, there's these two ideas. It was not apparent before. That's a nice, still another way to use that. You have the stability that you use and compactness to do that. So therefore, you bring it down, and then you get u bigger than or equal to v, and therefore u is equal to v. That was a proof we had with in this result with Nirenberg and Caffarelli. So, okay, so we have that's a proof, and also proves, by the way, it proves also monotonicity and proves some other results as well. Um, so, as I pointed out to you, describing this method, this proof of uniqueness strongly hinges on the fact that the graph is uniformly Lipschitz. Because, you know, if you do translates, you're going to get, in another graph, you're going to get close to the boundary. So the whole thing dies down, the whole, the whole proof breaks down. So, in fact, this was, uh, uh, for instance, uh, y equals x squared, uh, in a parabola, is it unique? This was open. This problem was open for up to now. And what we prove is this. We prove we have a generalization of this uh, result that says, suppose your domain is asymptotically flat. So it, so it doesn't mean that u is Lipschitz, that v is Lipschitz. It just means that if you look far away, you, uh, you know, up to a rotation, you have a flat domain. So asymptotically flat is this. So for instance, the parabola is such a domain. Right? Then, if omega is bounded by an asymptotically flat graph, and f is of positive st 
type, then the solution U is unique and converges to one as D goes to one, and it's also monotone with respect to Xn. The whole thing carries over to this case. This, so this result will prove is call. And um, uh, just to give you an idea, what we have to, to, to devise a new strategy for that. So what we did with call was this. First of all, the epigraph structure means that if you look far at, at infinity, omega will converge locally up to an iso isometry to a half space. So uh, by previous results, we know that half space is contained in the result I just showed. It's a particular case of ellipsis graph, phi is equal to zero, right? So in half space, the solution is unique and it's stable. So, uh, well, this wasn't the stability was not in the paper, in the previous paper, we had to prove that. But anyways, you have a unique solution, which we call uh, cap little phi. And phi uh, actually only depends in one, you know, once you know it's unique, it's obvious that it only depends in one variable. Because otherwise, you, by translating it parallel to, to, uh, to, the other, to the other directions, you would have other solutions. So it's ind independent of all the other variables by uniqueness. Right? So phi only depends on Xn. And therefore, phi is a solution of this ODE on the real line, starting at 0 and positive and going to 1 at infinity. So that's a so unique such phi. And what I say is that, in fact, with some work, we can prove that this solution is stable. Now, not only is it stable as a one-dimensional solution, but also when you consider it as a solution of the uh, half-space problem, then you can prove that this solution is strongly stable. So some property which is important. So therefore, we expect, because of that, we expect the solutions to converge. Uh, the solution, if you take a solution, we expect to converge it to, to this one. What does it mean? It means that if you take capital phi to be little phi of the distance of x to the boundary, then you expect that you will converge to this phi uniform. In fact, this is true. You can prove it. That's not so difficult. Uh, you can prove it because you have to take this distance of x to the boundary because you don't know you know, which, which directions you are going to look in, right? You want to allow any, every direction. OK, so that's a lemma. Co every solution converges to phi uniformly in omega. And, uh, and let me, uh, uh, OK, so let me, let me skip this. And the next thing, as I said, that the asymptotic, the exact half space solution is really stable. Therefore, we hope that for phi, it's going to be the same thing at infinity. And, uh, and it's true, but it's true only asymptotically. So what we prove here is that when you take this solution phi, look at the linearized problem. So if you have to look at minus Laplace minus F prime of capital phi, then the eigenvalue, principal eigenvalue of this operator in omega, but away from a ball of distance r, so omega minus br, br is a ball of radius r, the lambda one is strictly positive. So this is the stability result we have. And again, this again uses Leib's result. Because it allows us to study windows now of in the complement of BR, so it can be both for the scale, let's say. And you can fix this, and, and, and in these windows, because you have local convergence, you know, remember, this asymptotically flat domain means you have local convergence. If it converges uniformly, there is no, no question here. And therefore, by local convergence, and the fact that Lieb allows you to do, to use, uh, Local, uh, local windows, as it were, then you have this convergence. So again, you know, this is quite, uh, if without Lieb, it would be, would be difficult here to, to it's, a, it's a subtle property. Anyway, so this is what's happening. And therefore, we have, uh, in fact, we have this, so it's positive way. In fact, you also can prove by using Lieb's result, the other inequality is not difficult, that you actually convergence of this as R goes to infinity. Okay, so uh, now we'll take two solutions. And uh, we're going to do the same sliding arguments that I outlined before for the uniform Lipschitz case. And uh, again, u and v are, they are almost equal to phi at infinity. So outside the large ball, because phi is stable, you have the maximum principle. That's really the main idea here. Outside the large ball, you have the maximum principle. And therefore, 
uh, everything will reduce once you choose your R sufficiently large. Everything will reduce to studying what's happening in omega intersect BR. Ah, but omega intersect BR is compact. Then you can indeed compare U and VH because by compactness. And therefore, because of this, you have this stability that will allow you to transfer what inform whatever information you have on omega intersect BR to the rest of the ball. You can keep translating UV downward and keep this inequality because you only have to look at what's happening in the bounded domain. So you can slide it all the way to V and therefore you get U is bigger than or equal to V and therefore uniqueness. So you see this idea is again uh, uses this uh, compactness and stability decomposition. Well, okay, so uh, we can go further. <laughs> we can go further. Uh, and this is, we like to call it mise en abim. I don't know if you know, mise en abim is when, you know, when you have two mirrors facing each other, you, they reflect to infinity. Well, we can go for one mirror, let's say, here at the time, <laughs> for two mirrors at most. So mise en abim means if your domain, so we, we prove it's asymptotically flat, it's okay. We know that for uniformly Lipschitz, it's okay. Then if the domain is asymptotically uh, uniform ellipses, which means locally it converges to Lipschitz graphs. Uniformly, so locally it converges to uniform Lipschitz graph with a fixed constant, so it's going to be the same for everyone. But it doesn't converge globally. Then uh, you have the same uniqueness and so on. So, of course, this uh, begs for the open problem, uh, which I present to you: Is uniqueness does uniqueness hold in any epigraph domain? It's very tempting to say yes at this point. But it's open, and we have to use these deep results to, to prove that even. So it's, this, it's a very simple question, right? Does you, need, you, you can almost ask it to a student, uh, for instance, like Frank, if Frank <laughs> were to come to my office and say, oh, Frank, by the way, can you prove? <laughs> OK, so does uniqueness hold in any epigraph domain? OK, so uh, by the way, what is so special about epigraphs? You know, remember, we saw that in bounded domains, it's not true in general. We saw in neural space it's true in general. And we have proved it that, in, again, uh, essentially in epigraphs, of the full result is still, uh, still elusive, eludes us. Uh, we have proved that in epigraphs it's, it's true, basically. So what is special about epigraphs? You can say, what, what, are, what are you talking about epigraphs? Take any unbounded domain. Is it true in any unbounded domain? The answer is no, because Typically, what you can do is that to choose one of your domains for which you know there is no uniqueness. Uh, choose an F, a domain omega not. Remember, it's not KPP, because KPP we, we treat it separately, right? So we take an F for which we have no uniqueness, take an omega zero in such a domain, and therefore, once we do that, because the true solutions we constructed in the bounded domain omega zero are both stable there, you can construct actually solutions in the whole domain omega zero connected to this by this long neck. And this solution, one will be, will be close to the lower solution omega zero, and one will be close to the upper solution. So no uniqueness in general. So, and in epigraph, this doesn't happen. So the structure, the geometric structure of an epigraph, which doesn't allow you to hook up a pocket from below to the domain, plays a role. Can you give more general geometric descriptions? That's also an open question very natural open question in this framework. OK. Um, then, then we have a bunch of other results. Let me just quote uh, a couple. So for instance, we can always say that uh, what we call an exterior star domain. Exterior star domain, for instance, you take a domain which is star-shaped and compact, and uh, star-shaped about, uh, about the origin, say. Then the result says that in the exterior of such a domain, there is always uniqueness. Remember. That could be inside the domain, there is no necessary uniqueness. But outside, there is always uniqueness. So it really has to do with the fact that there is a lot of room outside. Um, I'm not going to, again, this is the same type of technique, uh, except that of, instead of doing sliding or doing, uh, or doing uh, multiple, I just do here scaling. I, uh, well, scaling or dilations of the variables, or independent variable. So looking at u of x divided by lambda. And uh, this is a sub-solution because of the sine of f, and, and therefore you can, uh, you can do the same argument, and you can start moving lambda to a critical position 
where you can compare the two and then you get uniqueness. Uh, so if you think of all those things which I have described to you here, they, have a, they, they share a common trait, right? They're all, uh, they, this, this is why we like to call them stability compactness method. Basically, general idea is to, uh, which allows us to get uniqueness, but not only that, you, I didn't mention that, but also stability properties, are the, I didn't mention it, the proof of how we get stability of the solution in the Lipschitz graph is something which relies on this, uh, on this method as well. And uh, so stability, symmetries, uniqueness, and so on. And we, we, so it amounts that decomposing the domain in two parts, one which is, comp well, you have compactness. It doesn't mean the domain is compact, but you can use compactness results there. Another one where you have stability. And the stability allows you to extend whatever you have, uh, you have reaped from your uh, compact part and extend it to the, to the other part as well. So this is general. So then the tools that you use may depend from a problem to another. It can be uh, sliding, it can be scaling, it can be dilations, it can be, uh, as I think, for instance, the moving plane method. In the version I gave with Nirnberg of the moving plane method. Uh, here. Okay. So the moving plane method, uh, some of you may, may know this method, but we want to prove that it's a theorem that says, for instance, minus Laplace u equals f of u in the domain omega, u is positive in omega, and u is equal to zero on d omega. The only assumption is that f is c1. The moving plane method says that if omega is symmetric, let me write it roughly, uh, vaguely, let's say, that u inherits the symmetries of your domain. That's, and that's done by the moving plane methods and the Alexander of moving plane methods. And the version we gave with uh, Louis Nierenberg of this method consists in, in having a plane was that the same as the other, the Alexander of method. You take a plane, you take a reflection of u inside. Uh, this is going to be u of x is going, v of x is going to be this reflection. So u, x lambda is this reflected point. This is, say, xn equals lambda. And, uh, and you want to, to study the sign of v, of v, so it's v lambda, let me call it, v lambda minus u. You want to sign, study the sign of this. And once you know the sign of this, if you can continue proving the sign all the way to maximum prop, uh, position of symmetry, then you get that one is above the other, and therefore you have symmetry. Yeah, that's to prove that when lambda is equal to zero, v is actually equal to u. Because if you go all the way to the symmetric part, to, to lambda equal to zero, you will prove that here, this u here is less than u there, which of course means they are equal. Now, the, the proof, the, the way we use that with Nirenberg was to, to say, okay, so the original proof relied on very heavy uh, analysis of corner points, because you want to apply the maximum principle, you have corner points here. It's quite difficult, actually, and not general. For instance, the result was not known in a square. Take a square. Is a solution symmetric? That was not known for the moving plane. So with Nuremberg, we have this idea of, we, at the maximum position, we take out a compact set K here. And we say, OK, if you, uh, if you are at a position where V lambda minus U is positive, then it's strictly bounded from below by positive constants in K. Therefore, you can move around, you can fudge around with lambda, decrease a little bit lambda, still keeps this inequality in the compact part. And here you see by construction, up to the point where you have the maximum position, v lambda minus u is, is bigger than zero on this part. And here it's positive because u is equal to zero. So on the band it's positive. And here, on that's what is inherited from the compact, from the compact part. There's a boundary here where v lambda minus u remains positive because it's compact. And we carve this k so that the domain which is left here a small volume, small measure. And the maximum principle applies in domains with small measure. Or if you prefer, the principal eigenvalue goes up to infinity in this case. That is what we did with Nirenberg in this case. But you see, this really belongs to the same general class of stability, compactness, decomposition.
So we have seen it in very different guises. Okay, so I will uh, have used up my time. Uh, I wanted to say that uh, what we have seen is uh, this general aspect of uh, this uh, method. And, um, and it's combined with other tricks. You can think of many other things. You can compare V and lambda U, or U with the dilation of U with lambda, or U and sliding, or U moving plane reflection. You can compare. This is, a general, this is a general principle here. As soon as you have a device where you can introduce a family, one parameter family, then using this decomposition, even in unbounded domains, will lead, lead this type of results. And uh, there are, of course, open questions. Uh, we have seen examples of this, but there are open questions. Is this true in general epigraphs? And I should point out that nothing is known for Robin conditions. Robin conditions is a very natural thing. You would expect that in a, in a, in a nice epigraph uh, with Robin conditions, it's completely open. And there uh, are many other questions, like are stable solutions ordered? In the examples we have, they are, but is it true in general? That's a natural question, in fact, to ask. So with this, thank you for your attention, and thank you. Coming from reaction diffusion, it's f of 0 equals 0, f of 1 equals 0. But in other type of problems like nonlinear optics with saturated nonlinearity, f of u would be just bounded, f of 0 will be 0. Anything you can say about that? So, um, so that's a uh, good point. It's true that you want to look at many. Uh, what I can say is that you can use this method to prove non-existence of solutions in certain domains. So for instance, if you, if you have a bounded solution, if you have an f like the one you dis just described, right? So f, which goes like that, doesn't go back to 0, right? Mm -hmm. Suppose you have a bounded solution of this, right? So suppose the solution is going to be in this interval of values, from 0 to 8, let's say, right? Then I can always bring back my f the solution I have will not see the difference, yet my result will say there is a unique solution and it goes to one at infinity. Therefore, it's not the one you had before. Okay? It goes to at infinity. So, so this type of results allow you to obtain, um, uh, to obtain non-existence results for many other types of non-linearities like that. So indeed, indeed, in fact, some, some very, uh, uh, scalar field equations I mentioned, you can also make some discuss this. What is true is that I should say that um, f prime, I made the assumption that f prime of 0 and f prime of 1 have signs. f prime of 1, I'm annoyed that we make this assumption, but we made it. We make it. Uh, so natural to try to get rid of it. f prime of 0 is a more complicated business because there are cases where there are solutions, for instance, in all of space, I said, I said that uh, one is the only solution. Well, you can find solutions which are bounded of minus Laplace u equals u to the fifth in R3. You have such solutions that go to 0 at infinity. These solutions will be solutions of a problem like that. So you don't have uniqueness. That's an example when f prime of 0 is equal to 0. Your f prime can be strictly negative. That's not a matter. But your f prime of 0 will be 0. And therefore, you will have no uniqueness. I believe that we should be able to, to extend this condition to say that the, the decay, uh, that the way that f of u behaves near u equal to 0, maybe we can go beyond linear. I assume that from 0 positive means linear be behavior. I think we should be able to go to like a power below the Fujita exponent, or maybe even below the critical exponent. I don't know. But this, for the moment, is, is open. So, so that's uh, my comment about other types of, of nonlinearities. That's a good point. Yes. Would it be possible to use your framework when it comes to inhomogeneous uh, Dirichlet boundary conditions? So say, for example, a V, which is also about, um, strictly non negative, uh, but she is non zero. Yeah, on the boundary. Yes. Um, that's a good, very good point. I, 
I guess so. I guess you should be able to do because in the end, what we want is to compare V and U, right? So if you have a part where, uh, let me give you an example of this. Okay, for instance, I want to compare V and uh, and um, so so it depends what problem. But let me let me think about the problem where I want to compare V and lambda U or, or U and lambda V. I want to show that U is less than lambda V for any lambda bigger than one, which in the end shows U is less than or equal to V. So this, if you have a G on the boundary which is positive, you have it for free at the boundary. All our problem was to worry about uh, what's happening when they are zero. But in those parts where they're not zero, it works perfectly well, right? So you have that. Now, that's one part. Now, for the, for the, uh, for the um, uh, sliding method, it doesn't work. I'm not even sure the result is true because for the sliding method, you move, you know, one of the things we had, we needed to know that U was below, was that U was above V shifted by H in direction N. Now, if V, when V is zero, when U is zero, when V is zero there, then on the boundary, then you have it freely because U is positive, V is zero. So when V is non zero, then you don't know. So if you have a way to say a priori, that you that in the direction xn v is above g. So, for instance, suppose you have a subsolution of your problem that allows you to say that you that any solution is going to be above this g. Then the same proof works. But you will need to have this information. That's a very good point. But we we, we need we need this type of information. Thank you. Any other question? Then, as we thank again.